for the city. All right, thank you for joining us for the fourth um, presentation and the first online Mountain Story 2021. Uh, so this has been a fun couple of weeks and um, I am going to introduce Michael Finkel, who is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Stranger in the Woods, about a highly intelligent man who lived alone in the forest of Maine for 27 years, as well as a book, True Story, about Finkel's bizarre and unhealthy friendship with a murderer, which was adapted into a motion picture produced starring James Franco and Jonah Hill. Finkel has reported from more than 50 countries across six continents, covering topics ranging from the world's last hunter-gatherer tribes to conflicts in Afghanistan and Israel, to the international black market in, of human organs to theoretical physics. His work has appeared in National Geographic, GQ, The Atlantic, Esquire, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, and the New York Times Magazine. He lives with his family in Western Montana and Southern France, where he is now and just had some crock pot pork. Um, and I read Stranger in the Woods on a camping trip and it was just wonderful and lovely. And it was funny in the campground, there was a, a kid who had a doom buggy and kept like lapping the campground. And I, I was like, how? And it was destroying my silence. And silence is a big theme in the book too. And I had to stand off with this kid with his dune buggy. Um, and it was just an interesting juxtaposition to be in this nature space with a kid with like power motors and stuff like that. And then reading about this guy who um, left society. So thank you for investigating, doing the writing and I'll hand it over to Michael Finkel. Thank you so much. And Mike, please, it's Mike. Mike. Too little too formal, you know, it's just the, just the uh, just the uh, byline. Hey, hello, everybody. First of all, uh, thanks for joining at this unusual hour. Uh, it's um, 8.20 here in France, so we had to sort of make things work. And I understand that it's possible that you're missing a powder day. And so I will attempt to make the next 45 minutes approach the wonderfulness of a powder uh, run. Um, all right. I'm gonna put a little bit of screen sharing on and you're welcome to comment or even ask a question in the sidebar. It's a little bit in, um, informal. You see, I have no notes in front of me. So we're gonna sort of, we're gonna sort of freelance it. And I mean, obviously we're all like, we're all doing things unusually here. I can't believe I'm speaking to you via Zoom. You know, usually I can look at an audience and feel if they're like, all right, get on with it, Mike, or yeah, this is really cool. So if you would like to give me some facial indications that I'm either being interesting or not, you can, but uh, if not, I'm just going to try my hardest. Okay. Let's at least tell a story. I'm going to share a screen with you and I don't know if you want to do like one of the, you, you guys can set it, but it'd be kind of cool perhaps to do like the, um, the shared screen where you can sort of see the speaker in this. Okay, this is the great state of Maine. I'm gonna assume you smart folks know that Maine is you know, up in the north or northeast of the United States. This story takes place in central Maine. Uh, let's say around the M where the word Maine is right there, right in the middle of Maine. And um, well, let's see if we can get this thing going here. Might need to fast forward. Oh, but one more try, this first little technical bit. Oh, okay, it takes place around this pond. This is called North Pond. And you couldn't tell from this photo, if you look at the shoreline, you really can't tell. There's about 200 cabins, all pushed back just a couple of, uh, couple of feet into the woods. And the really simple cabins, they look like this and like this. And there's really just very thick, woods around there. And these, uh, these cabins um, are mostly used during the weekends and in summer. It's pretty quiet there, midweek and in the winter. And the 200 or so owners of these cabins, everybody sort of has a different way that they encountered the mystery. We'll just call it the mystery for now. Some people, you know, uh, they, they put a couple of steaks in the freezer and 
They left for their job for the week. They came back the next weekend. They opened their freezer and the steaks were gone. It seems a little weird. Somebody else noticed that all the batteries from his flashlight and the things that his electric things were missing, all the batteries were missing. Someone else had been reading a Stephen King novel and they left it on their bedside table. They went back to their regular home for the, um, uh, for the week and came back the next weekend, no more Stephen King. And these are sort of weird things because your TV's still there, your computer's there, no one touched your jewelry, your money, you're not gonna really call the police and tell them that your you know, AA batteries in your Stephen King novel are missing. But you know, there's like barbecues and get togethers around this pond and everyone seems to be missing something, propane tanks. Someone said they lost a bunch of frozen chicken. Someone else said like all their National Geographic's got taken. And, and so people go back to their cabins. someone has been inside my cabin and they call the police. And the police say that, uh, yeah, they've received dozens of calls like this, that someone had been of a smoke detector, which one family does. And if I'm right, the next slide will show it. And they get this picture, oh, there it is. They get a picture. And if you look carefully at your screen, you can see that there's like a guy back there in someone's cabin. And when you look at it, you know, people weren't really sure what was going on, but they gave a name to this, uh, you know, legend after 10 years, they called him the North Pond Hermit. But really people thought it was maybe someone, a neighbor or someone who lived nearby. And if you look at this picture, this is not a hermit looking dude. He doesn't have a big long beard. In fact, he kind of looks, if you look carefully, he kind of looks a little fat. And with this picture, and I think there were like three or four other pictures, they give them to the police and the police are like, like now that we have photos, and now we see, we will definitely catch this person. And 10 more years pass. And so we're more than 20 years, 21, 22. We're at a quarter century where things are missing. In fact, people who grew up with this hermit, hermit stories, hermit legends, there's people writing like, um, college papers about it, folk singers singing songs, uh, people that, you know, they, they, they have children of their own who it's like a second generation of this hermit man. And 25 years go by and really nobody knows what to make of it. Nobody has ever been caught. They don't find it, you know, and it's like this like legend grows and it's like, you know, there's the like the Loch Ness Monster, the Himalayan Yeti and the North Pond Hermit. And finally, after 27 years of this mystery, one person decides they are going to figure out what is going on. And it's this person. This is a Sergeant Terry Hughes of the Maine Game Warden Service who happens to live nearby. And he looks pretty serious there. He is a very serious man, also quite kind. But he decided on his free time that he could not stand this mystery any longer. He literally went to Homeland Security, and I won't get into the details, and he put like electric eyes all over the forest, and he had this machine that would ring in his house that would wake him up if any of these things were tripped, and he practiced going from his home uh, into the woods. And uh, not only did this hermit break into cabins, he also broke into this summer camp that was along the pond. And at the pine tree camp, inside of this building, in this kitchen, after 27 years, Sergeant Terry Hughes found this person. His name, it turns out, is Christopher Knight. 
And when he was arrested by Terry Hughes, well, this is what Christopher Knight, by the way, looked like in high school. And the night that he was arrested, pretty much everything he said to the police boggled the mind. He said that he had been living in the woods for 27 years. He said that in all that time, now, you guys live in Jackson, most of you, I assume. You know about winter there. Maine, I would tell you, after 25 years in Montana, I'm going to tell you Maine winters are even worse because they're kind of that wet cold as opposed to the dry cold. This guy told the police that he, in 27 years of living outside, he never once slept inside, he never once used a toilet, he never once spent any money, and he never once lit a fire for fear that smoke would give his campsite away. He never saw a doctor. He never spoke a single word except one time he accidentally passed a hiker in the woods and he said, wait for it, he said, hi. He said that in 27 years, he spoke a total of one syllable and until the night that he was caught by Terry Hughes, he had never had a conversation or been touched by another human for more than a quarter century. Now, I heard about this by just reading the small town. I love to read small town newspapers on the internet. I was living in Bozeman, Montana, and I read this story broke in the local paper, and I read about this, and I was sort of fascinated, like, here's this guy that lived in the woods, and I'm wondering, you know, is he just, is he just crazy? Or, you know, hum hermits have been sort of a, a, a source of fascination for, you know, forever. And did, you know, did, did he have something to say? What did he learn? Why, why did he do it? How did he survive? Is it even true? And you know, there was the, these stories in the paper that he had stolen books. So clearly, you know, he obviously liked to read and I love to camp out and I love to read. And I was just sort of following the newspaper and I was waiting for him to say something to uh, the local journalist. And I waited for about a month and Chris Knight, who by the way, because he was broken into broke into uh, the, the camp, he was caught breaking in, he was put in the county jail. I waited a month and Chris Knight, the hermit said, nothing, nothing. The guy who says nothing for a quarter century says nothing. And I can't stop thinking about him. And you know, my, my family tends to go to bed pretty early. My wife and my children go to bed early. And it was one night I was alone in my house in Bozeman. I'm thinking, well, heck with it. I'm gonna write this guy a letter. And I decided to do it the old fashioned way, with pen and paper. And maybe some of you guys remember these things. They're called um, envelopes and stamps. They used to have them back in the, back in the old days. And I hand wrote a letter to Chris Knight. And I basically said, I'm a journalist. I'm fascinated. I have a lot of questions for you. Perhaps you'd like to talk with me. And I had recently been on assignment for a National Geographic magazine, and I had written a story about a hunter-gatherer tribe in East Africa that lived all of their time outside. And I thought he might like the article, and also I wanted him to see the kind of stuff I wrote. So I made a nice color photocopies of the great National Geographic photos and my article, and I mailed my letter and the article to the Kennebec County Jail. And to my surprise, about a couple of weeks later, uh, and we'll do a little show and tell now, a couple of weeks later, uh, let's see if you guys can see this. This exact, this is, this is not a duplicate, this exact envelope appeared in my mailbox in Bozeman, Montana. Probably can't see, it says Chris Knight in the top here and the address of the jail. And there's like this rubber stamp on the back, very probably, very hard to read, I'm sure over, over the Zoom. And it basically says Kennebec County Jail. These contents have not been evaluated. Basically it says, read at your own risk. And I go to my mailbox, it's kind of a very thin letter. And I'm like, whoo, remember this guy hadn't spoken to anyone in more than a quarter century. So I'm very excited to see what the person who has said nothing for 20, what might he say? And I, remember, I sat at my desk and I opened the top of this letter and I opened it up and there's just a single sheet of paper in here. And this is what was inside. Well, this guy's, this is Onwas. This is one of the leaders of that hunter-gatherer tribe I mentioned, the Hadza of uh, East Africa, they live in Tanzania. Uh, 
and Onwas, according to the article, you know, he's, he's about, he's in his mid forties and he spends all of his time outside. And I remember sitting there at my desk, looking at this picture of Onwas that I had mailed to Chris Knight himself. And I'm like, what does this mean? What, you know, what, why would he send this to me? Is it the person who says nothing for 27 years? Does he, does he answer a letter without any words? What's the implication? You know, ah, this is kind of, this is kind of annoying and frustrating. This is, you know, doesn't really mean anything. And then I turned this over and I saw that Chris Knight had written a small letter on the back. And these were some of the first words that he had shared with anybody in 27 years. And it's not a very long letter, but just from the couple of paragraphs that I read, I knew three, three things about Chris. One of the things that I was worried about Chris Knight was that as I mentioned before, he just might be crazy. But clearly the way he wrote in this beautiful sort of old fashioned style, he was clearly intelligent. Surprise to me, he had, I do the second thing I knew, so he was intelligent, he had a sense of humor. So I knew that Chris Knight stole along with his food and his clothing and his other things, a lot of books. And so I thought, oh, you know, I love to read books. And so in my initial letter to him, I told him that I love to read. And I mentioned that uh, Ernest Hemingway was one of my favorites. And it's funny that the, you know, someone doesn't speak for 27 years, but one of the first things that Chris Knight decided to do was engage in a little bit of literary criticism. And one of the things he says in his letter is, uh, I feel rather lukewarm about Hemingway. So he was engaging in some literary criticism. And then the third thing I knew about Chris Knight from this letter is that he had one heck of a story to tell. And over the course of a summer, we exchanged letters back and forth. And uh, you know, briefly, I learned that Chris Knight grew up in Maine not too far from where he was arrested, but uh, his parent, his mother who was still alive said that they had never heard a single word from him. Nobody had heard from him. He you know, came from a pretty uh, mod, uh, a family that was not at all well to do, but uh, his teacher said that he was an extremely bright kid. Nobody thought that he was particularly strange. Um, he said to me that, uh, that he, uh, he left home at the age of 20. You know, most hermits, when you think about hermits in history, you know, they leave, you think about old people, old men or old women, you know, that's sort of in the, in the, in the winter of their lives, you know, sort of retreating to their cave. But Chris Knight, when he was 20 years old, he drove his car up into the woods of Maine. He put his keys in the center console and really without any plans, without map, without much food, really without anything, he closed the door, walked into the woods and didn't emerge again for 27 years. And after we wrote letters back and forth for a summer, uh, I went to visit Chris Knight at the Kennebec County Jail. And we ended up speaking to each other for more than nine hours. Now they let you have about one hour to visit in the jail. And so he permitted me to visit him nine times in jail and interview him. And this is how I learned his story. Now, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of questions come to mind when you hear the Chris Knight story. How could you possibly survive 27 years without lighting a fire? That's like my number one thing. Uh, how could you go 27 years without seeing a doctor? You know, um, and of course, the big question: Why? Why would you do this? Also, I had some other questions, which is his campsite. He lived in the same spot for like 25 of his 27 years. And it really wasn't that far away from other people's home. You, you, there's those 200 cabins. How come nobody found him? How did he not? There's this uh, famous storm in Maine, the great ice storm of 1998. How could he not have died in the great ice storm of 1998? Anyway, Chris Knight says to me, you will learn the answer to a lot of these things 
if you go and visit my site. And he, I got some cryptic instructions from him on how to find it. And I went on a search for his site. Let me, um, let me uh, fill you in on this. So this right here, this picture that you're looking at now is uh, the actual woods. I took all these pictures where Chris Knight uh, had lived for basically 27 years. He kind of wandered around for the first couple of years and then settled into this spot. So let's see. This, by the way, if you remember the picture of him being a red, so this is what Chris Knight looked like the day he was arrested. And when I interviewed him in jail, this is what he would look like. So hold on one second. So the day he was arrested, when he was a hermit, he looked nothing like a hermit. And then after seven months in jail, when he was no longer a hermit, he looked kind of exactly like a hermit. And Chris Knight told me this was sort of his version of a practical joke. But while he was in the woods, he never looked like a hermit. If you have a beard like this in the woods, he told me, it just gets filled up with ice. And it's just, you know, it's like, it's like skiing on a powder day with a big beard. It just, it's just ridiculous. So he looked like a hermit when he wasn't a hermit. And when he was a hermit, he didn't look like a hermit. And that's just the way it goes in hermit world. Now, he gave me some instructions to his site. Uh, this is what North Pond looks like. Winter in Maine is like a six month ordeal. You guys know about that over there. I certainly know about it from my time in Montana. Uh, that's North Pond that you saw before in winter. Uh, this is the closest road to where his campsite was. Now, if you knew exactly where you were going, you could walk to the nearest cabin from his site in three minutes. And yet for 25 plus years, nobody found his site. And I found that almost impossible to believe, but we're gonna go through everything. Uh, it's private property. Chris Knight spent his entire uh, hermitage on private property and still nobody found him, even with hunters and fishermen and everything. Um, again, thick forest. Uh, the forests of Maine, if you haven't been there, are not like the forests that we have in the West, which are more lodgepole open forests. The, it's incredibly claustrophobic in there. In fact, I would step from the driveway into the woods and my glasses would fog up. It held its own humidity. But that's not the reason why his flowers, that's not the reason why nobody found him. Bugs, rabbits. Let me tell you the reason why nobody found Chris Knight's site. Now that is my hand right there. What I'm putting my hand on is a boulder, but not just any boulder. The entire forest floor where Chris Knight hid out was filled with about automobile sized boulders or a lot of glaciers came in through uh, central Maine during the last ice age. And when they retreated, they left these rocks behind and they are everywhere. And they are coated with about an inch to an inch and a half thick moss. And I, I, you know, I'm a pretty decent hiker, but I'm really used to hiking in the West. And I had no idea about this. It really makes the going not just hard. The first time I had a little backpack on, the first time I put my boots on top of one of these, on the side of one of these rocks to go over, I slipped, I cut my hand wide open, I sliced my shoe apart. It is impossible, should we look at a little blood for a while? It is impossible to navigate through this forest. In fact, deer hunters told me that in the spots with its chock full of rocks, deer don't even go in there, so nobody bothers. So I understood the sight lines are about 10 feet. Nobody could see anything filled with rocks. Now, of those of you with good eyes, can you see Chris Knight's sight? I am literally 10 feet away from Chris Knight's campsite right here. You can't see it. It's very hard to see. Let's go in a little. There we go. We'll zoom in a little bit. This is where Chris Knight lived for 25 years. You could see even he painted a little camouflage on his garbage cans. Everything that you're looking at, Chris Knight stole. When the police arrested him, they told him that you would have to return everything that you had stolen. And he said that the only thing he owned in all the world that he hadn't stolen were his eyeglasses. So everything was stolen over the years. Uh, just a little bit, zoom in a little bit more. Uh, you can see that he has, if you look, there's like um, an entrance, there's like a green uh, camp stove. Let's see, I think the next picture, picture shows it. This is like his main structure that he lived in. He uh, stole those propane tanks for, not for heating, but for melting, mostly for melting snow, to, for drinking water and for cooking a little bit. Uh, he stored water in those uh, large uh, 50 gallon or those large uh, uh, plastic uh, ga um, garbage cans. He usually kept a couple of them uh, filled with water for drinking. And when the water went bad, he would use it to uh, bathe. 
He said to me that his closest companion may have been a mushroom. This mushroom uh, is about the size of a dinner plate in this picture. He said he watched it grow from the size of a watch face to a dinner plate over the course of a quarter century. Uh, some of the cookware that he stole, he loved flashlights. These are some of the flashlights he stole. Uh, he, for entertainment, he read a lot of books, as I mentioned, he listened to the radio. And if you look right in the front, there's a couple of Game Boys that he stole. And Chris Knight told me that he had a, a very strict Game Boy policy, which was that he never stole any Game Boys that were either one or two, the first or second generation old. He didn't want to deny you know, he's, a, he's a thief, but he had a code. He didn't want to deny any children of their Christmas presents. He would wait until there were a couple more generations and then he would be stealing those anyway. Uh, that, that green bucket and the uh, camp stove that's closed in that picture, that's his kitchen. His bedroom is the tent inside of the structure and that's where he would uh, cook his food. Um, this clothesline that was wrapped, this tree grew around the clothesline. And in fact, one of the police officers, the one Terry Hughes that you saw, told me that he wasn't sure if Chris Knight's story was true until he saw things like this, where it, trees in Maine, as with uh, Wyoming, grow quite slowly. And for, uh, for a tree to subsume a uh, clothesline like that does take about a quarter of a century. And this is the only known picture of Chris Knight in his camp, which was snapped the night he was arrested when he showed the police officers where he lived. Now, let's get into a couple of answers here. First of all, in the age of COVID, I think we could probably realize, figure out how Chris Knight didn't need to go to a doctor. How did Chris Knight not get sick for 27 years? When I would talk about this book before COVID, nobody knew the answer, but now we know because he didn't, he was completely social distance. He didn't get in touch with any other human being. He, uh, he exchanged germs with no one and therefore he never got sick. Now you can still get something like cancer or diabetes, but literally by isolating himself, he was never sick for 27 years. Um, what else, what other doubts did people have? Oh yeah. Uh, the great ice storm of 1988, how come, uh, 1998, how come he didn't die in the great ice storm? Now the great ice storm there, you know, it knocked out all the power, cars skidded off the road, but Chris Knight told me that he wished that there were more great ice storms. Uh, ice storms are really not that cold. It was like 28 degrees during the ice storm. It put down this layer of ice all over the place. And Chris Knight would not leave his camp normally during the winter because he didn't want to leave a single footprint in the snow. But with the ice, he could walk around, steal things and uh, make it back uh, without leaving any tracks. Otherwise, he would literally stay in his sight for months at a time, eating whatever food he had, or he would wait for a snowstorm to come that would cover up his tracks. Now, my question to him before we get to the why was, how could someone possibly have survived the brutal cold weather without lighting a fire. Now I'm telling you to do one night, I mean, it's like, it'd be like winter camping in, I guess it's February, winter camping right now, tonight, go out, go and sleep outside, put on your best clothes, don't light a fire tonight. You make it one night, you'd be like pretty proud of yourself. Imagine doing that for a week without a, go, go camp in the snow for a week, go camp in Yellowstone for a week, the next week without lighting a fire. That would be pretty damn impressive. Try it a month, try it a whole season, Try it 27 winters, it boggles the mind. And I remember talking to Chris Knight in jail, you know, I, I consider myself a fairly experienced camper. And I was like, wow, Chris, you must have just like put yourself in like two or three sleeping bags and like maybe got into the fetal position and sort of just like gutted out the whole night, just like suffering. And he, he had this funny way of, you know, Chris Knight, a man of very few words to say the least, he didn't really like to even make eye contact, but he had this way of expressing when he was, uh, when I said something that was, was stupid, in fact, he would just give me this long sort of disappointed blink, nod his head, say completely wrong. And I wanted to know how he survived. And he told me this. Now, Chris Knight wasn't sure of the year. He actually had to guess at the decade. He sort of listened to the news on the radio sometimes. So he was a little familiar, but really he didn't care about that. He, knew the season and of course, and he would steal a couple of watches, always analog watches. So he knew the hour and the minute. He said during winter, he went to bed every night at 7.30 and woke up at 2.30 in the morning. That is the depth 
of cold. That is when, you know, it gets to be negative 30 in Maine and it blows like crazy. And Chris Knight, you know, when you or when I certainly would be like trying to huddle in my bag, that is really when hypothermia starts. There's just no sleeping bag. There's just no way that you can stay warm enough. And hypothermia will start at your toes and your fingertips and, and march to your heart and, and will kill you without a fire. But Chris Knight would get out of bed at 2.30 in the morning, would put snow in his pot, and he would pace the perimeter of his little site around and around and around all night, every night, all winter for 20 seven winters and he never lost so much as a fingernail to frostbite. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts, but really I think what I'm here to talk to you about and what I think is the most interesting, and before I leave us, let's get into the why. Why would a 20 year old kid, a bright kid, I mean, we don't all have to be social. You can be introverted, but come on, 27. Why? Why would you leave the world? So he didn't even tell his parents. They thought he was, they didn't know if he was dead or alive. They, they, he, he communicated with no one. Why would you do that? And normally when I'm reporting a story, you know, the closer I come to the source of the story, the more people explain it to me, the more clear it gets. But in this case, when I talk to all the families that own the houses on North Pond, they, believe, they didn't even believe it. They said that they couldn't get their head around it. They couldn't understand it. It was impossible. And the main reason why we have trouble believing a story like this is because, as I think we've all learned over the past year when dealing with, with, this, with the coronavirus, is that humans are extremely social creatures. We are, we are a social species. We love to hang out with each other. In fact, while working on this story, I started doing this funny little informal poll. And if I had time, or if I was in a real audience, I would watch your faces. But I started asking people, and I want you all to think about this for a second. I went around and started asking people, what's the longest time that you've ever been alone in your life? And when I, what I, what I mean by that is no, no seeing another person. So if you, you know, even during this whole year of confinement, I live with my wife and kids. So, I've not been alone for 10 minutes. Uh, no seeing someone, no making a phone call, no text messages, no emails, no communication, no seeing. Remember, no communication with another person. You could read a book, watch TV, listen to the radio, but no seeing anyone else. And when I ask this question, most people would think about it and think about it. More than 90% of the people I ask this question to admitted that they have never spent one day alone in all their life. And I consider myself a great outdoorsman and I do these solo backpacking trips, but when I really thought about it, even my five and seven day trips in Montana, I always encountered someone, stopped and chatted and exchanged power bars and whatever and snacks. I never did more than 48 hours in my life. Most people never once, we, uh, we just don't like to be alone. While researching, I remember reading the story about uh, this experiment run by the University of Virginia in which 60% of men and 30% of women would rather give themselves electric shocks than sit in a dark room with nothing to do for 15 minutes. Humans do not like to be alone. Uh, why do humans rule the planet? We're not the fastest species. We're not the strongest. We have big brains and we can link them all together. And this is, we are basically programmed to work together. We don't like to be alone. However, one interesting thing throughout all of recorded history, right to the earliest things we've been writing down, uh, there are clay tablets from Mesopotamia and writings etched on animal bones found in China. We have been writing about shamans mystical men, people living alone in the woods throughout all of human history in every culture, there has been this tiny, tiny, thin stream of people that have wanted to separate themselves from everyone else. Now that's sort of interesting, but let me tell you something even more interesting. 
this tiny, 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 one fiftieth of 1% of the population, this tiny stream of people have had a profound influence on all the rest of us. I'm just gonna name you three people in history that spent a significant chunk of time completely alone. Let's start with uh, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha. Currently, three billion people follow the religions brought back by three, those three people. Jesus, as you may recall, spent 40 days and nights in the Judean desert completely alone. Muhammad uh, took a huge retreat in a cave in present day Mecca and Buddha sat by himself underneath a tree in present day India. Uh, Albert Einstein said that he had no friends. Michelangelo said he didn't want to be around anyone. And Isaac Newton, the founder of modern physics, uh, I think he was celibate and never had any friends. So, so hermits, solitary people have changed the world. Now, Chris Knight, I said to Chris Knight, why, why did you do this? So get away so profoundly and Chris Knight, his answer, I think, was both, I guess, frustrating on some level and also profound. He said to me, you know, I tried to guess, like, did you commit a crime? You know, he left in the early 80s. Were you embarrassed about your sexuality? Was there something, you know, was there abuse in your family? He said, no, 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 none of those things. He said to me that it, he, I think he described it like a gravitational pull or like a homing pigeon. He just said all his life, he felt like interacting with other people was very uncomfortable and that he felt this pull to be by himself. And it's interesting if you read, now Chris Knight never wrote a word down, but if you read other people's accounts and I read and read, in fact, pretty much all these books behind me are accounts of hermits, uh, right? From Walden to uh, on down. Um, he said, a lot of people say that they felt this internal tug to be alone. So he said that he felt this tug to be alone. He felt this calling and most all of us, you know, we make compromises in our lives and Chris Knight sort of fulfilled his innermost desire more than, any, more than anything. But I, I think the more interesting thing is that when I asked him how he felt, now remember he suffered in winter, he walked around his sight. Chris Knight told me that he loved it. He loved it being alone. He loved, he wasn't happy about stealing, but he expressed more contentment about his life, about his time in the woods, about his 27 years than almost anyone that I speak with out here in the rest of the world. He said to me that he was never for a moment lonely or bored. He said he didn't even really understand the definition of loneliness or boredom. He said he felt, he said by himself, he said he felt ultimately connected to everything in the universe. He said he felt part of everything. He didn't feel at all lonely, bored, or, or, or at all missing anything. He had no interest in coming back to society. He said to me that if he was not arrested, breaking in, you know, he wished that he could hunt and fish, and we'll get to the reason why he didn't in a minute. If he, he said that, um, you know, if he wasn't arrested, that he would have spent his entire life out there in the woods. He would have died in his sight. Nature would have taken, uh, taken, uh, you know, eventually disposed of his body, and no one would ever know anything about him. And until he was captured by Terry Hughes, the uh, the game warden you saw, you know, that was that was his plan. And before I open it up to questions, and I mentioned the hunting and the fishing, um, you know, I guess if there's anything that I've sort of learned from Chris Knight or can impart with you, you know, when I was talking about how nobody spends time alone, it's like really, really and truly, the only person you really can know fully in the world is yourself. We're all trapped between our ears you can never fully know another human being. And you know, a lot of philosophers say that loneliness is really the only true feeling there is. You know, we, we will all die and we're gonna descend into death completely alone. We can't take anyone with us. We're locked in our own heads and yet we're terrified 
of spending any time alone. I mean, watch, I watch my children, you know, the minute they have three seconds alone, they go into their pocket and they take out their phone and they, they you know, they, they, they want to connect. None of them, we're all terrified to spend time alone. And, you know, uh, one of the things I sort of, sort of learned from Chris Knight is that sort of the, the pleasures and the terrors of spending time with yourself, of calming yourself down. And I guess before this pandemic struck, there would be a lot of times when I would be driving in traffic in Bozeman and my kids would be fighting in the back and I would be late to an appointment and my phone would be buzzing off the hook with messages and I'd be late and then I'm listening to the radio and it's one bad news after another and I'm feeling stressed and you know I'm just thinking you know it's not Chris Knight who's crazy I feel like it's the rest of us and so I hope that I made some sense tonight remember it is a little bit it is a little bit late here and I have I have no notes and I'm speaking into the void <laughs> but um, I'm going to take a seat right now and I'm going to open it up to questions. But I guess before I even answer that question, you know, one of the first things that people like to know. And by the way, even if you've read the book, this is the one thing I wished I had put in the book and I left it out. Darn it. If I could write it again, I'd put it in, which was why didn't Chris Knight hunt and fish for a living? Why did he have to break into cabins? Doesn't that sort of ruin the whole dang thing? And um, while you prepare your questions, I'll answer this. Why didn't he hunt and fish? And I, I posed that question to him in jail and I loved his answer. You know, he's, again, as you're imagining, not a man of, of, of many words, um, he said to me, Mike, and I'm sure this is the same in Jackson. He's like, Mike, what happens uh, when the bears come out of hibernation in uh, Bozeman and uh, you put your garbage can out? Does it happen in Jackson that the bears knock it down and, and dig through it and eat your leftover chicken? It happens in Bozeman all the time when all the neighbors call each other, bring your garbage in. You know, why do the bears knock down the garbage can? Why don't they just go and pick berries that day? And the answer, of course, is that, especially in cold parts of the world like Maine, Wyoming, and Montana, you need to be energy efficient. And the reason why the bear is taking that garbage and eating is that it's a lot easier, a lot more energy efficient than picking berries. Uh, the bear is using its resources, its brain to get food in the least energy using way possible, especially like I, like I said, in a very cold part of the world. Chris Knight said to me that he believed that breaking into cabins was behaving more like an animal, more like a natural, more nature centric than hunting and fishing. For example, it took less energy. He used his brain, his God-given brain to pick locks. Now he had a code. He never smashed a window, kicked in a door, took your jewelry or computer, but he used his brain to pick locks, open windows, take your food, use as little energy as possible. In fact, he would often, if he picked your lock, he would lock the door. And so he closed it behind them so real thieves wouldn't break in. And if he had spent all that energy trying to catch one fish and he would have starved to death. So he believed to me, he believed that it was the more natural thing to do to break in and steal. And whether or not you agree with that, I found the answer fascinating. Um, okay. I feel like I've babbled long enough. I'm going to take a sip of water. Is there anyone? I'll answer any question in the universe. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Let me just see if I can see if there's any hands raised. I'm going to see that. And you can also unmute yourself and ask it to him directly if you feel comfortable doing that or put it in the chat. I thought there see. was a Okay. If you, a does anybody have a chat. question? Some people would like to know, um, oh, I'm looking at, now I'm finally looking at the, uh, Sorry, when I had the freaking slides on, I didn't see this thing. Da, 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 da. Okay, isn't it weird that parents go looking for me? Oh yeah, these are great things. Again, it's a shortish talk. Uh, yeah, it's really weird that his parents didn't go looking for him. Let me answer that question. Let me see, people often wanna know what is he doing right now? Uh, was he uncomfortable talking? Okay, parents first. Uh, yeah, he came from an unusual family, a very quiet family. Uh, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. Uh, he was 20 years old when he left for good and his parents never filed a missing persons report. And, you know, if my children were gone for like three hours, I'd like, you know, have helicopters and all the world looking for them. But he was 20 years old. My children are much younger than that. And uh, I did not get to talk. His, his father passed away. I did not get to talk to his mother. She did not want to talk to anybody. 
Uh, but I asked the local police uh, officer in the town he's from, like, isn't that weird that he didn't, that the family didn't file a missing persons report? And the police officer said to me, no, I don't think that's weird at all. Um, they're very keep to themselves family. They may have hired a private detective, but they really, I think he phrased it as like, you know, small town manners, they keep their dirty laundry to themselves. He was 20 years old, considered an adult. Um, if you, you know, it was, it was not a matter of getting the police involved. And so I can't quite get my head around it, but again, I'm telling you a true story. If you know, if it was fiction, I would make things a little neater. Uh, was he uncomfortable talking with me? Hell yes, very uncomfortable. In fact, why would he talk to me at all? Well, Chris Knight was really smart. Um, uh, his lawyer told me that something like 500 journalists tried to get in touch with him. Now, um, and I'm the only one that he spoke with, which proves that he just has, you know, great taste in journalists. Um, and so I will always be, I will always be forever uh, grateful to Chris Knight. I, in fact, I have no real reason why uh, he chose me to get back in touch with, but I have a, I have insights. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom always made me, I don't know if any of you had this, my mom always made me hand write thank you notes to all the kids that came to my birthday party. Uh, and I just grew up with this sort of, it's important to hand write a letter when you truly care about something. And I think of all 500 journalists, probably half of them text message to his lawyer, the rest type something up. I probably, I don't know this for sure, but I may have been the only person who hand wrote a letter, pen, paper, ink. In fact, one of the lines I didn't read you from his letter, at the very bottom, it says, handwritten letters are always personal, whatever their content. And it might've just been as simple as, uh, as, as that. Um, so yes, what was his punishment? Wow, there was a great debate in Maine uh, about what to do with Chris Knight. Now, I didn't get into this and you know, I tend to speak very warmly about Chris Knight, but Chris Knight himself, said that I should not romanticize him. I think he used that exact phrase. Don't romanticize me, Mike. Uh, you take the good and the bad. He was guilty. He admitted to 1,000 break-ins over his 27 years. Now, for breaking into someone, now, and it wasn't like the hamburger meat that he stole or the, or the Stephen King novel that was really thing. It was he stole people's peace of mind and sense of safety. And you can't put a price on that. One of the things I really like about this story is the vast range of reactions people have to Chris Knight, which comes from, I hate this guy. He's basically a homeless, lazy thief to this is my new guru. Uh, I love him and nobody is wrong. So he really engenders a lot of different reactions and where you are on that scale, it doesn't, it, I, I, I'm fascinated to hear your story. And the people whose houses he broke into were all over the place. It almost reminded me of like political differences. Sometimes a family would be split. Like the, the wife would be like, oh, I knew he wasn't dangerous. And the husband's like, I wanted to shoot him and kill him, uh, you know, in the same house. Um, and they did not know what to do with him. For breaking into a house one time without permission, you can get 10 years in the state penitentiary once. And he admitted to a thousand. So he basically could have gotten life in jail, but even the prosecutor said there are laws and then there are humans and they gave Chris Knight seven months in jail and a very harsh probation, which he observed to the letter. He's, I was gonna say he's not really a criminal. He's not a violent person. Of course, nobody knew that breaking and they didn't know if he was armed. And so it was a very complicated situation. Uh, I think, what is there an expression? Um, if both sides are uh, dissatisfied, that's a sign of a good deal. And so uh, anyway, he spent seven months in jail uh, and he's released, he followed his probation and uh, he still lives in society has not gone back to the woods, at least not yet. I keep thinking that I'm gonna read that he disappeared again, but he is in his fifties now. And he even told me that uh, cuts and bruises weren't uh, healing as quickly. You know, you, like, a, like an athlete, it takes a real lot of energy to live in the woods. You're probably not gonna have a long lifespan. And he found it getting more and more difficult. He felt like he was getting colder and the winters were harder for him to cope with. We are no longer in touch. Uh, so I mentioned the 500 journalists uh, one of my favorite comments that sometimes people say to me when I tell this story is, uh, wouldn't this have been a better story if you, 
never told it. If you uh, sort of, this is clearly a person who did not want publicity. And what you're doing, Mike, is giving this private person publicity. Now, when someone says, wouldn't this have been a better story if you didn't told it? There's really only one answer, which is oh, a much better story, much better. And also pretty much been easier for me to work on because I wouldn't have to do it. So um, yeah, I asked Chris Knight about this also. 500 journalists, he said to me, remember, this is a smart guy. This is a guy who can go 27 years without speaking. I'm not gonna trick him into speaking. This guy can shut up for a couple of decades. He said to me, I don't wanna talk to you, Mike. I don't wanna talk to anyone, but after getting 500 goddamn letters, he knew that he would be hounded his whole life and that if he just decided to tell one person his story or as much as he wanted to tell, I'm sure he kept a lot of things to himself. This is what he told me. And then said, that's all I have to say. Write your dang book. It could serve as sort of offense. And I'm happy to report to you that Chris Knight has not been bothered by curiosity seekers or other journalists or, 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 or documentary film crews. Uh, basically, he said his piece to me and said, I have nothing more to say to you. And though I felt friendly towards him and wanted to be his friend, when he was done with me, he was done with me and we are no longer in touch. And the way we left it with our last meeting was um, I said, Chris, would you write me a letter? I would love to stay in touch with you, but I understand that that's not what you wanna do. Would you write me a letter uh, if you want to get in touch with me? And he said, I will. And that was three and a half years ago and he hasn't been in touch. I sent him my book as soon as it was done, six months before it was published. And uh, I heard back nothing. Um, generally speaking in my life, if, uh, if someone doesn't like something, they'll let you know. Um, but uh, so I, I'm assuming that he thought it was fair. I had written a magazine article about him before I wrote the book and he actually read the magazine article. And then we met afterwards and he said to me, oh, there was things I liked and things I didn't like but it was fair. And I think that the book itself had the same tone. Now let's go see if any more questions. Uh, do I think he regretted living his life in isolation? No. Hi, Laurie. Hi. No. <laughs> nice to see you. You're all in the shadows right there. I uh, could not uh, see your face. Hi, this is amazing. Uh, <laughs> and so no, I don't think he regretted being alone at all. And nice to see you nice also. The other journalists are just jealous. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> um, movie, uh, has this been optioned uh, as a movie? Well, you know, it's sort of one of those hard, I guess the short answer is yes, but uh, not for like a million dollars type thing. It's a kind of a weird movie. It's gonna take just the right, you know, it's basically a guy who does nothing and lives by himself. And, you know, it'd have to be like that, was that Castaway, Tom Hanks or something like that. It, it's, it's not the most obvious uh, movie and I, I have no control over wh whether it becomes a film, but there is some interest and in, I'm interested in people's interest, but I, I, you know, I don't know what will happen. I assume it would never, never be a movie. It's the thing, one of the things I actually like about this project, I'm a writer through and through, uh, is that it, I think the best medium for this story might actually be words on a page. And in fact, I mean, you could read this any way you want if you're interested, but I kind of like, I'd say get it on paper, don't read it on the Kindle, but that's just, that's just me. Um, uh, let's see, uh, I see a question. Uh, Chris said he's so connected to the universe. Did he mention that he ever formally meditated? Oh, I like this question about meditation. So yeah, I, you know, Chris is, I talked about religion and meditation, you know, Chris, um, Chris did not, I, I would say that he probably did meditate, but he, you know, he was such a funny stickler for words. Oh, by the way, um, one of the, one of the, some of the doubters who doubted that the story was true, they would say to me, oh, how is it possible that a man cannot talk for 27 years and then suddenly speak, you know, wouldn't your voice, wouldn't your uh, vocal cords curl up and die? And by the way, the answer to that is, no, they do not curl up and die. And the voice does not live in your throat, it's in your brain and you read a lot of books and his brain was working fine. So. That, uh, that is an easily dismissed one. Your vocal cords don't curl up and die if you don't use them. By the way, I mean, I, I try not talking for 27 years and see if it's true, but I'm pretty sure that that's correct. Um, so he, he was so funny because he was very like, Chris Knight was very stickly about words. So if I said you would meditate, you'd probably, ah, oh, that's a terrible word. You know, I just sat there quietly thinking about nothing. I'm like, well, that's meditation. No, never meditation. So he would be very, you know, he would, he would insist 
that he would never meditated. And I would probably tell you he meditated many hours a day and was probably like, you know, achieved a minor nirvana. But, uh, you know, our conversations were always so prickly and precise that, uh, you know, I remember when I told you the story about uh, tossing, uh, you know, I, I would like to check facts when, you know, when I, when I wrote the book, I was, it was, you know, such a hard story to believe that I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. Uh, you know, I would read him back parts. I was like, and so you tossed your keys in the center console and walked into the woods for 20 to 70 years. She's like, completely wrong. I'm like, completely wrong. He's like, no, I put my keys in the center console. I did not toss them. I'm like, okay, sorry. Everything else was right though. <laughs> anyway, um, are we at the end of the line here? Let's see. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one, Chris. Uh, Jim Mahaki, I have a question. Um, when you're in a camp for 25 years, there's an awful lot of human waste. What is, what is, how did you handle all that in that one spot? Okay, uh, it was a little bit garbled, but I think you asked, what did he do with his garbage, right? Is that what the question? Yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, so he had a garbage dump. Now, Chris Knight stole everything. And so his diet was, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear in these things. His et was effed up, man. It was a terrible diet. I don't feel like swearing. It was a terrible diet. So remember, so he didn't like go to the supermarket and buy like health food. He went to other people's houses and stole what they bought. And it turns out that the people of Central Maine, like many of us, don't have the greatest diet. And so he stole like a lot of Twinkies and uh, 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 instant um, mac and cheese and things like that. And he wasn't a very good cook, um, but he would eat everything all, he scraped everything clean and he buried everything in a dump spot. And then he would put soil over the top and layer it. But yeah, he had, I would have to say, considering, you know, there were some people who said, uh, you know, this guy, you know, for being, you know, living out in the woods was basically putting garbage in the ground. But really, uh, I see the amount of garbage my family of five makes in a week. And this guy for 27 years really left a very minor imprint. He did have about a hundred uh, used propane tanks, which he would put in a black garbage bag because the reason why, if you remember those pictures, they had a lot of camouflage on it. He didn't want the sun to glint off something and maybe a hiker or someone would see it. So yeah, he had a, he had a dump pile. It smelled completely natural. There was no odor at all since he ate everything that was degradable and put a little bit of, um, a little bit of soil. Uh, yeah, there's lots and lots of points I could have talked about. One of my favorite things is that, you know, after he would steal magazines, read them, and then he would make bricks of magazines, like cinder block sized bricks of magazines, bind them with duct tape, bury them beneath the soil. So he had a perfectly flat floor and these bricks of magazines sort of aided with drainage when, um, when there was a lot of rain. So he had a dry site and, you know, uh, uh, I remember him telling me in the, uh, in one of our jailhouse interviews, like, you know, they checked out my site, the police did, and they found all these magazines buried there. And they called me crazy for burying magazines, but it was floor tiling. Everyone knew, everyone could see that. And I'm like, all right, Chris, man, I would never have guessed that. I don't freaking know why you buried your magazines. Um, anyway, um, I thank you for your time and your attention. I hope all of you got some little nugget of wisdom tonight. That was fantastic. And Chris is right. The book, like reading it is a really great medium. We have copies at the library you can borrow. And we also um, had some copies to give away. And I think there's one left up at the front desk. So whoever gets there first can have that. But this is, and he, he, there are so many more details like the magazine bricks and um, eating only prepackaged food that wasn't opened and that kind of stuff that are truly fascinating that he tell and you we have a really great story, Mike, it's wonderful so I encourage you all to read it. Thank you all for spending this really, you know, noon on a Thursday, my goodness, I'm really appreciative and now I'm going to spend a little time with my children so thank you so much everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank, have you. A Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have, have a great day. Let's Bye. just get, let's all get vaccinated and get this done with. And uh, I'll see you on the slopes soon. I miss skiing terribly. Thank you and have a great day. And spend a little time.